So there I was, a groomsman at a wedding reception with an open bar. Now, different people react in different ways when they've had too much to drink. And the groomsman I was sitting by at the head table was the introspective type. He told me his life story, including abandonment and abuse, and how he became an atheist. And then he asked me, how can anyone believe that God exists? I said, I hate to hear what you've been through, and I don't blame you for having doubts. I don't have an answer for you right now, but I do have a question and an invitation. My question is, hypothetically, if all your questions had answers that provided more reasons to believe in God than not, what would you do? And he said, whoa, I was not expecting that. I'll think about it. What's your invitation? I said, my invitation's twofold. First, I want to invite you to join me in a future investigation of your questions. And second, in the meantime, I want to invite you to pray the skeptic's prayer. God, if you're out there, would you please do whatever it takes to help me find you? To which he replied, wow, I was not expecting that either. I'll think about it. I learned something big that day, and that is to never give a 10 cent answer to a million dollar question, especially at a wedding reception with an open bar and when it's time for the bride to toss the garter belt. It was conversations like that that created in me a passion for befriending and learning from people with different beliefs and backgrounds than my own. So over the course of two years, I set out to conduct 50 interviews, treating each individual for coffee, asking them 20 questions, and even drawing their portrait using one continuous line. And what started as a series of curious interviews soon turned into a series of unexpected adventures and unexpected discoveries. I did not expect the chance to introduce my atheist friend from China and my Muslim friend from Saudi Arabia to what we call s'mores around a campfire or having them in my home for Thanksgiving dinner. I didn't expect the chance to get to serve pancakes to college students at midnight during finals alongside a Jewish rabbi and a Muslim professor, or the chance to serve and volunteer at a children's home in Honduras alongside my agnostic friend, especially when his dad passed away the night before our plane was scheduled to depart. And on an even more sobering note, I didn't expect to get a, a call at 3 a.m. from one of the students that I interviewed who was now contemplating suicide. I don't know why she called me first, but with the help of some police officers, we were able to track her location using her phone and save her life and get her the help that she needed. Those were just some of my unexpected adventures. And now I want to share with you some of my unexpected discoveries. One of my interview questions was, hypothetically, if, if, if God and heaven are real, on what basis do you believe God will or will not accept you into heaven? You might expect that people would have cringed at a question like that, and maybe you just did. But since they knew I was just asking questions and not sharing opinions, they were quick to open up. And many articulated their beliefs for the very first time. Here's what some of them said. My life has been characterized by thinking I have to earn God's acceptance by being a good person. You'll be judged for your deeds. If your bad deeds are more, you'll go left. And if your good deeds are more, you'll go right. If you try to abide by the Ten Commandments, that's going to put a little bit in your favor. The key basis for me is that I've tried. I am seeking to live as morally and ethically as I can. Effort is the difference maker. There's a big difference between those who don't care and those who try. I like to think 
it would be based on your actions rather than your beliefs. God will probably not accept me into heaven because I've done bad things. And I don't know where the line would be drawn. Despite such diversity in the people that I interviewed, I discovered an overwhelming consensus about the afterlife. In fact, even many atheists believe that if God does exist, then acceptance in heaven depends on performance on earth. I always got a kick out of the times people would say to me, that was one of the best conversations I've ever had because I didn't actually contribute to the conversation. I thought, man, I might be onto something here with these one-sided conversations. So I, I went home, I, I tried that on my wife, but uh, it did not have the same outcome. Another thing that I didn't expect was that over 50% of the people that I interviewed wanted to meet up again. And it wasn't just for the free latte. Many of them actually wanted to interview me. Two of the most common questions that I heard were, one, do you believe all paths lead to God? And two, with reference to Jesus, how can one person's death enable another person's forgiveness. So I want to share with you two illustrations that I share with them and how they led to one of my greatest, most unexpected discoveries of all. So the first illustration I call the mountain theory. Now I've adapted this from a book by Dan Kimball, which is called They Like Jesus But Not the Church. The mountain theory claims that all paths lead to God. Now, when you look at the major world faiths at the base level, you do see two significant similarities. Number one, they all pretty much agree that living a moral life leads to peace. And number two, living an immoral life leads to chaos. However, while most religions have these two similarities, they also have two significant differences. The first difference is that religions lead to different mountaintops. Buddhism leads to no God. New Age path leads to everything is God. The Hindu path leads to many gods. The Jewish path leads to one God through the Torah. The Muslim path leads to one God through Muhammad. And the Christian path leads to one God through Jesus. Now the second difference is that Religions claim different ways of restoring peace from chaos. All the major world religions, with the exception of Christianity, believe that eternal peace is obtained on the basis of our merits. Christianity believes that eternal peace is obtained on the basis of Jesus' merits. Now, in response to that second question, how can one person's death enable another person's forgiveness? I share what I call the cockroach illustration. Now, most of the people don't want cockroaches in their home, but however you decide to get rid of them, there's no penalty in a court of law for doing so. There's no debt to pay. However, if you were to kill or violate a person, the penalty would be vastly greater. In a court of law, a person is more valuable than a cockroach. So if the penalty increases according to the value of the one offended, then what would be the penalty for offending an infinite God? It would be an infinite penalty, a debt so great that none of us could ever pay that. Now this illustration is not meant to say that God views us as little bugs. To the contrary, Christianity claims that it's because God values us so much that he sent his son to rescue us. But if it's true, if it's true that we can't pay that debt and make ourselves compatible with God, then we would need someone who had no debt of his own, who was already compatible with God and equal to the value of God to pay that debt for us. And that is exactly what Christianity claims Jesus accomplished through his death and resurrection. Now, I didn't expect that a couple of illustrations would cause so many people to say, 
I just understood Jesus for the first time, especially because so many of the people who said that were or had been Christian. At this point, I was very interested to know whether or not my limited observations could be confirmed by a nationwide study. And that's when I found the Barna Group in 2019 asked U.S. Christians what they thought of this statement. If a person is generally good or does enough good things for others during their life, they will earn a place in heaven. I was surprised to learn that 21% of Christians agree with that statement somewhat, and another 23% agree strongly. This was so perplexing to me because when I asked people in my interviews, what comes to mind when you think about Jesus? Everyone who had been raised Christian could tell me all about him. Born of a virgin, performer of miracles, fulfiller of prophecies, they knew all about Christmas and Easter. But when I asked those same people, on what basis do you believe God will accept you into heaven? The majority of them didn't even mention Jesus at all. And since that time, I probably asked a thousand Christians that same question, and almost without fail, 80% of them appeal to their good works as the basis for God's acceptance instead of Jesus. And I wonder, where is the disconnect here? So I went back through and I reread all 50 manuscripts from my interviews in search of a clue. And here are some of the statements that jumped out at me. I was taught Jesus came to be the standard we're supposed to live up to by which we'll be judged. His mission was to be the perfect model of a human being. He wanted to teach, if we're all like him, how the world would be. Heaven would be based on the moral principles Jesus taught. If you violate those principles and don't repent, I suppose you won't be allowed into heaven. If you're going to put somebody on a pedestal to idolize or try to live up to, it would be Jesus. He came for people who were blind to let them see their faults and try to correct themselves to come back in favor with God. I think of Jesus as a role model. And there it was, my greatest, most unexpected discovery of all, a misconception about Jesus as a role model. Now, don't get me wrong. If we're talking about how our lives can be changed by following his example and following his teachings, then yes, in that context, Jesus is a role model. But if we're talking about how we can obtain forgiveness from God and eternal life, then in that context, no. Jesus is not a role model. Christianity claims that Jesus came not to show the way to heaven based on our merits, but to be the way to heaven based on his merits. Christianity claims that Jesus is not just the model but the Messiah. So the person who does rely on him instead of themselves is meant to become a good person. But it's not to be forgiven. It's because they're forgiven. It's not motivated by guilt and fear, but by love and gratitude. So I share these discoveries today not to offer a case for Christianity, but to offer a case study for the unexpected adventures and unexpected discoveries that can be experienced when we open ourselves up to understand others and understand ourselves and maybe discover some truth. So whether you're at a wedding reception or a coffee shop, it's okay to say, I don't have an answer for you right now, but I do have a question and an invitation to which your friend just might say, wow, I was not expecting that. I'll think about it. Thank you.